Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another night of Show and Share, Tuesday night. Hope that we have three projects that have signed up. We may have more. So why don't we get this kicked off with Mark showing a media room table. There you go. It's another, this is another PowerPoint presentation. Every time I come here, my fingerprint gets sweaty. There we go. It, it doesn't recognize me. All right. So um, this this is going to be all about my my media room couch table. So the, the the first thing to start out with is. Why did I decide to build the thing? Um, I couldn't find anything off the shelf that would even work. It's, it's taller than a coffee table. It's shorter than a kitchen table. It needs to have room for my legs to go underneath it. I needed shallow drawers in front for uh, remotes and candy and a big snack trough for chips and stuff in the back. So, um, and, oh, so what is where? This is the trough. <laughs> So I'll, I'll get to that more later. So yeah, it, it didn't end up looking exactly like that picture. I was starting to learn SketchUp, and, uh, and then I gave up, and I, I just did it all on the fly in the shop. So first thing I had to do is tool up. Uh, I was going to make some big, thick veneers out of uh, bird's eye maple and some other things. So I, I got a big, got a table saw with, uh, I guess, 14 inch of depth cut. And then I built some in-feed and out-feed tables so that I could run this big table thing across it. You can actually see it um, at the end of that. And then I uh, made it, the in-feed, out-feed tables actually, they, they hook to the other side so they can be a side table as well. So that worked out real well. The front legs just pop up and folds flat against the wall. And, and I mentioned here that this was with the initial rosewood edge banding and I just didn't think it, it, it didn't go well with the white oak. So like I cut it off and started over. I decided this looked much better with the white oak, so um, went with the sapili, ribbon sapili. So I, I used Baltic pour, uh, a three quarter inch Baltic birch core, um, and the idea being that this is gonna be a, uh, it's all gonna be laminated together, but I didn't want the wood shifting around on me and expanding and contracting a lot, so it was a lot of glue. Um, anyway, so then I, uh, okay, so this is the glue up for the, just the edge banding with the sapili. And then I, I learned how to use a card scraper and got a card burnisher and played with all that stuff. Um, on the underside, I put a quarter inch white oak, so I uh, miter cut that. Um, and you know, I was told that I basically had to laminate the top and bottom or it would pull one way or the other, so did both sides. Um, so then I uh, jump into the the bird's eye maple for the top. Um, I started uh, running it through the table saw, so you can see there's a, a deep cut in the top and the bottom. And then after running it through the table saw on both ends, then I ran it through the uh, through the band saw. I guess if I was better at resawing, I might not have had to put the slots in, but I was still figuring it all out and getting my band saw tuned and learning all about that. Um, so I was about half an inch thick to start with. Um, I, I worked it down some, so that's. Not quite lined up, but that's about what I got out of the bird's eye maple for the tabletop. So um, this was also multiple steps. So I started out, there's wax paper underneath the whole thing and I was uh, just getting the book match. So this is just the seam edge being glued up. Um, oh yeah, and before I get to the next part, I learned a few things about ebony in the process. I, I kind of freaked out. I, I bought all this ebony at, at Jeffrey's and uh, I started cutting it and it was all light inside. I'm like, well, what am I going to do with this? And I called him up, and he's like, just put it outside. So, so this three is actually, I'm sorry, not three. There's actually four strips on the side there. And that gives you an idea of what it looked like when it was cut. And then with some sun, and the very bottom was after it had been out in the sun long enough to be dark like I wanted it. 
But uh, yeah, I've, I've found a number of woods are like that. They look funny when you first cut them open. So, um, so I glued and trimmed it in steps. So at this point, you can see there's a little ebony edge banding, or not uh, like an accent stripe, and then there's some uh, quarter sawn, kind of highly figured white oak on the end. And then I basically ripped down each side to give me a nice straight uh, thing to cut the next one on. And then uh, once I had that, I was able to do this. So I had all the steps I went through here in terms of seaming and trimming and you know, gluing and et cetera, et cetera, until it was all together. So then I, I got to learn the wonders of hand planes and, and sharpening and got my diamond stones and learned how to maintain. And, and actually, I, I took an old hand plane my dad had given me many years ago and brought it back. I had to flatten the bottom and everything. It took me a while. Um, but that's, that's a new hand plane, not anything I worked with. But I really enjoyed that. It was pretty. Um, and then most people would have put a, taken a hand router and gone around it. I didn't have a hand router. I had put a lot of effort into my, my Uber routing station, so I, uh, I ran the whole table around the router the hard way. Um, then I played a whole lot with different dyes and stuff, and then I decided I liked the look of the woods itself, so I left it. So you can see a lot of pencil marks in there. Uh, this was how I designed the rest of it. I eyeballed it and I measured and I drew all over the place and that it all just came together out in my garage. Um, so I decided the legs would need to be removable and I was gonna through bolt them. And so there's inserts on the other side. So that's three quarter inch plywood and uh, you're not gonna see any fancy, um, you know, dovetails on this or anything. There's, and you can see the, uh, the pocket screws on this. So there's eight pocket screws and glue holding uh, these onto the uh, Baltic birch base. And then I later clad all of that. Okay, so I'll get to that in a minute. All right, so then, um, so I'd put quarter inch white oak around the edges. Then I took a piece of quarter inch plywood for the bottom. Um, and I, I, as I said in there, I, I dado cut slots uh, for the drawer supports, and then I glued all of that in place. Um, and then you can see, I, as I was going, it's like, well, I need to have access holes or I can't get the legs out, so I had to drill holes in the drawer support. Um, so this is just kind of roughed together. Um, I did not go with the, that as the, as the drawer fronts. Um, so you can kind of see the ideas. And, and I was doing everything with uh, three-quarter inch Baltic birch for cores for the main structure. And that was my first cut at the leg and it matches kind of the original drawing and my wife said that looks like it belongs in an office, it's ugly, get rid of it. I'm sh oh, and she used choice words. She really did not like it. She <laughs> said that basically that's ugly, it's not going in, in the media room. So um, this is a little further along. So you can see where I was starting to clad the base, around, you know, so there was that plywood and so I've got white oak completely glued around it. And uh, I decided I wanted the drawer fronts to be kind of prettier than that single piece. So I have white oak, bird's eye, Thapili, bird's eye. Um, that's this, by the way. Um, I guess you can pass this if you want. Um, that's a, um, so I cut three drawer fronts out of them and uh, with a bandsaw to get a really thin cut. Um, and this is more edge cladding. So it's just boxing around that thing. Um, okay, now we're getting to the, I thought I had my shooting board in here a little sooner, but when I did the drawer fronts, um, I, I used the bandsaw to get a really thin cut, and then I used uh, a shooting board with my number six uh, hand uh, plane to, get, to just shave it to get a, a 90 degree angle without taking much material off, because when you push all three drawers together, they look like a continuous piece, so I didn't want to take much away. So I started on on this thing, and so you can see you've got a white oak on the ends, and then it's got half inch plywood in the bottom, and then quarter inch on the front and back. Um, and that's the material I started with. And then this shows how, how the sides were shaped. Um, so they actually fit in. You can see there's a, a piece of wood laying across the top of the base up there. Um, that that comes down and actually fits into the slot on each side. It's about a quarter inch deep slot and that's what holds it in place. Um, 
So then it was time to put all the pretty veneers on it. So this is all the bird's eye maple and curly maple um, that I wanted to put around this so it looked prettier than plywood. Um, that took a little, little time. Whoop. I didn't mean to do that. Yeah, so the bird's eye really came out nice. And, and you can see that um, once I got the fronts and backs on, I put caps across the top. And it was thick enough that I had some room to sand. Um, I really liked how the curly maple in the bottom went against the, um, the live wood on the edge at the bottom, and then it worked its way darker into the dead wood, which is, I, anyway, aesthetically, I thought it looked really pretty. Um, this, this is my favorite piece that I've ever made. So this is when I'm, I'm finally seeing, here, here's what the trough looks like behind the, uh, the table. And my wife wanted something more like a pedestal. So this is, now once again, that's just the core. So that's the three quarter inch Baltic core. And then I was figuring out a shape in the same material I was gonna glue to the sides. And I wanted it to look just like the table top. So I used the same bird's eye maple with the, uh, with the ebony on the edges. And you can see at the top here, what was gonna be the foot. So I've got some thick pieces of uh, white oak um, glued up there. And then the other side was actually um, where it bolts into the table and there's more of a platform too. It's, it's very stable. I, I did not want to have a, a back piece across the legs for st stability. So I made these as solid as I could. Um, so you can see I'm starting to shape the feet at this point. And <clears throat> on the front and back of the legs, um, I thought it would be better if it was like an I-beam. So I capped it with a big piece of uh, white oak um, and I ran a dado to get the three quarter inch slot so I could uh, more, more strength and stability. And so the legs, I, I thought they were really pretty, but no. I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but I, I was, I stared at this project a lot as it went together. I was really happy with how it looked. Um, oops. And uh, all right, so these are the drawer supports. Um, so they went with wax slides, um, pretty simple stuff. So plywood got glued in, but it had the uh, white oak going around it. Um, and then the drawer that's being passed around um, also got that plywood at Jeffrey's too, the walnut plywood. It looked pretty nice. Um, there's my shooting board. I was considering bringing that with me today. Um, and then I saw the state that my number six uh, hand plane was in and uh, the top of the shooting board had actually started to warp up since I did this, but I was getting really nice, like thousandth of an inch. It, I, I was having fun playing with hand planes. Yeah. Um, so this is the final glue up with the drawers. Um, so I had basically glued the, them all together, so they were just solid. Um, you can see the white oak all the way around. And so this is initially, we got the shellac on it, Just it's just kind of, kind of coming together and uh, kind of impressive in that direction. You can see how the drawers kind of, the seams between them almost disappear. Um, and then, uh, then it was time for epoxy because I was gonna eat on this. So we wanted to uh, have a solid finish. So got the heat gun and the torch and measuring containers and uh, got some bar top epoxy. Um, so taped off the bottom um, so I could peel it off before it dried to get all the dripping around the edges and uh, blocked off all the vents in the room so that the dust would settle and made sure it was in good shape. And then uh, then used a heat gun, torch, and uh, got the epoxy finish, let it sit in the room, didn't go in there for a couple of days. And uh, I was real happy with it. The bar top finish, there was no sanding, it just leveled itself out as it cured. and. Uh, that's, uh, so there's some remotes in there, and uh, that's what it looks like without all the snacks that I just took out of this. Um, that they're all sitting in a container now in, in my media room. Um, and that's, that's how it looks in there. And uh, there's TV reflection. I thought it was kind of a pretty looking end to this. So, Okay, that's it. Any questions?
Thank you, Mark. And that's a great example of things we like to share, things that were successful. You shared a few mistakes along the way, and that's all part of show and share. Share things you had a good time with that you're proud of, things you went, uh-oh, maybe somebody else can learn from this. Uh, it, it's, uh, we're all here as a community. So next up, I have Kevin T. with some more electro etching. Is this salt water continued? Ah. Now, I want you to remember what she just said about the failure part. <laughs> All right, so last time I was here, I did the Triforce thing f um, from Zelda. And uh, in the meantime, I had ordered some stuff called um, Press and Peel Blue, which looks like, like this. See, how do I turn this on? I see a power, see. Oh, no, no, it's, it's there, it's just uh, needs ah. to be there. Yeah, it's there. Okay, so this press and peel blue has a, a shiny side like this, and it's got a matte side, and it's designed that you put it in your photocopier and you print out on it. Then, you get your, um, your metal and you get your metal a little warm and you push this on there and you apply like an iron or a heat gun and it's supposed to apply the blue onto uh, your metal. So I did that and it came out kind of like this. And if you notice that it's not all coming off and so I tried this several different ways. I took my metal and I even, uh, I thought maybe my wet metal wasn't getting hot enough. And even put it in the toaster oven on like toast uh, thing for like 30 minutes and it got all amber colored and just couldn't get it to consistently stick because all of these places where the, the uh, blue doesn't come off are places that won't etch properly. But I decided I'd go ahead and try. And I got this. So on the places, well that doesn't come through very well, does it? Is there a way to focus it? Well, so just take my word for it. The B there looks pretty good uh, on my thing. But like over here on this end, it just kind of peters out and there's nothing there. And then places like right here, these are supposed to be solid squares where you put in, um, you put in spindle speeds. And here it just, you know, it didn't get, take it all because there was no uh, color there. Now online people talk about if you're press and peel, if you had some holes, you could fill it in with like a marker. And I got some paint pens but I apparently either didn't give them long enough to cure or they weren't able to withstand the uh, salt water because uh, the, all the places that I painted, it just, didn't, it just came right back off. So my next uh, attempt that I'm going to do is I would like to take this piece, which is just a painted piece of metal, and I would like to use the laser CNC to etch off the, the paint. This has two uh, coats of spray paint. I'd like to use a laser to try to burn off the, um, the place where I want to get etched. So that's my next thing. And part of this is an appeal. I don't have the CNC certification and I've looked and I don't know when there's gonna be a class. So if anyone would be willing to work with me on this, I'd be appreciative. Thank you. Any questions? What was your um, process when you did it? Um, I wire wheeled it, then I think I washed it and then I used acetone. I don't know. Um, I think it's designed for making circuit boards mostly. And most of the instructions I see talk about using it with copper. And it may be a problem that this is steel and not copper, maybe why it's not sticking. Um, but that's mostly what I see is for you print out a circuit board and then you put it on there and then it'll etch it off. 
Anything else? Thank you. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Scott with the CNC Art. guy is dangerous. And if you want to show on a bigger view, that side. Well, stand up a little bit. That uh, computer's connected to the internet? No. Could you go to woodgrainterrain.com? <laughs> Your computer is, but mine isn't. Okay. I wasn't really prepared to uh, present here tonight, but... Uh, I don't know, uh, a few months ago I decided, I woke up one day and I said I want a CNC machine. And I said I want to carve terrain into wood. I have no idea why or how, but it's been my obsession for the past few months. I've hardly left my house, you know, other than maybe to find some wood to carve stuff into. Uh, I don't know where to start. Um, used to lead trips outdoors, got a master's degree in environmental education. And I work as a handyman here in Knoxville a job I am damn well sick of. <laughs> so I would hope that some some point I could turn this into a money-making thing. But uh, uh, I am the lucky, I guess, beneficiary of maybe three generations of tools. You know, my, my father, his father, his father, uh, my grandmother's father. So I have grandpa's Delta table saw from the, from the 80s. Um, I'm kind of lucky with that. Um, the CNC machine does a lot of the work, but you need a whole little workshop to support that stuff, I guess. One thing I try to do is find the most messed up pieces of wood. So anything with a void in it, the kind of stuff that most woodworkers would put in the burn pile, that's the stuff I search for and have a hard time finding. So this guy, this is one of my newest ones. And this is actually the first carving that's uh, from another planet, that is Holden Crater uh, on the planet Mars. I don't know. Where is the camera? The uh, camera here, but it's focused more towards that <laughs> side. I, of the, yeah. I feel lost because I have no idea what. <laughs> well, you got it in the light. It's okay. Thank you. Um, this was started out as a few inches longer. Of course, the planer was a fan of putting divots in it in the back side, so I cut it off. But Big old gnarly knot in the middle of this, covered with bark and everything. I filled it with a few different layers of resin, filled the back to cover it in. And uh, uh, this guy was on the machine for about 13 hours, which was pretty long. And of course, um, I try to build frames on some of those or legs or something else to, to put these things on. Uh, it's a little bit of a monster. But I do a lot of Tennessee stuff. Um, just this week, I did a moon and a Mars thing, which I can guarantee you I'll do more of. But uh, I, I, I can't emphasize enough, I barely know what I'm doing. I, uh, it's literally only been a few months, and uh, one of the things I, I uh, took to heart was if you're not making mistakes, you're not learning fast enough. So I still have all my fingers, which is good, but I, there's a lot of saws, a lot of sawdust, um, and there you have it, I guess. Please. So it's terrain, right? So is it like actual terrain or just some stuff that you've made up? So uh, I am not a digital designer by any stretch. And every one of these carvings is done from an STL model, the same file format that 3D printer guys use. And uh, a lot of this um, terrain data is created by the US government and is available freely for anyone to use it. There's a whole nother aspect of um, getting good data, that's a, that's a whole other story. It's been one of the more challenging parts. But larger pieces of land, like you know Chattanooga here, actually Chattanooga sits right about here. That's the Prentice Cooper State Forest and the Tennessee River Gorge. Um, that's a, a piece of ash, which you know they make baseball bats out of. So that's some pretty hard wood to be uh, doing its thing. 
But this size model, no problem. If you want to do closer, then it becomes more difficult finding the proper stuff. But it's all out there, and it's largely available for free, the big stuff. So there's a, the program I use is called Vectric V-Carve. It's made for CNC's, CAD and CAM. And you put the file in, you arrange stuff where you want it, you know, set your material stuff, and then it does all the work. Some of these, uh, you know, the G-code files that run the machine are just text files. And these bigger ones will have like a 35 megabyte text file, which is like 400,000 lines of code. <laughs> so they're, they're quite large. I, I want to do a mean that shows like my first carving, which was this big, with about a quarter inch of terrain height. And that's how it started. And then this is how it's going, you know. So uh, even this one, I really didn't try to max out. Um, the Martian one, uh, the piece is so twisted, you have to leave some material on. Uh, but the, the thinnest part of that wood is a quarter of an inch. And uh, the Grand Canyon model that's going around, if you hold it up to the light, you can see the light through the river at the bottom. I mean, it's uh, less than a 16th of an inch. So I've really tried to push the machine to get the maximum amount of terrain depth that I could in any one piece. And you know, you don't want the spindle racking against your stuff. So uh, I, I don't wanna, also don't wanna start my house on fire. So I try to keep an eye on it when it's happening. Uh, so, I, you know, if you buy a CNC machine, you should put a sign on the front that says Z, uh, zero out the Z-axis dummy every single time, right? <laughs> that tells your machine where the top of your piece is. There's a nice, you know, round hole in my spoil board where well, at least one time I neglected to do that. If you didn't have your cardboard, like, fly apart because you had a crack, you didn't expect You know, I didn't catch a bit in my teeth or anything, no, so there's that much. Uh, hopefully I'm smart enough to avoid the worst of that, but certainly there have been pieces that you know, bits rip through, ruin stuff halfway through. Those get thrown across the room violently before they put in the, in the waste pile. Yeah. Most of my raw material is somebody else's trash, right? Uh, I found a guy on Facebook who works at a furniture factory, that big piece of oak over there. They want nothing to do with that. It's worthless to them. But to me, it's, uh, it's just great. I also, um, because I'm a handyman, I've been to the lumber yards quite a bit. Uh, Mark at Wit Lumber keeps a couple buckets of messed up wood for me. I got some more from him today. <laughs> so uh, I'm always searching for wood with voids in it that I can carve crazy stuff into. Is it? Thanks for listening. <laughs>
that's for anybody that we want to bring the artist out in using welding. So scrap metal and we'll be tacking it together. Still one more ticket. One more. Okay. I, there was two. So you're I'm doing great. <laughs> Last ticket out there. There's a hand tool sharpening class on April 6th. A woodworking auth class on April 9th. On the other end of the shop, I've got a learn to sew class on the 9th. The laser cutting class on April 16th. The 10 o'clock class is sold out, don't bother. But Tracy gracefully added a one o'clock class. And when I looked, there was, I think, two tickets left. So maybe there's only one. Um, hurry, they're going fast. And that's all I have for classes. Oh, yes, Tracy? New member onboarding Thursday, is that uh, seven? Yes. Seven o'clock. Tracy usually brings some sort of sweet to have. Um, Isaac usually brings Oh, Isaac brings the sweets. So new member onboarding is great. If you're thinking about joining, uh, if you haven't been to a new member onboarding, come, um, whether you're a senior well, that maybe came out wrong. If you've been with Knox Makers for a long time <laughs> um, and want to refresh your memory, it's all about what we're at, about as an organization. So you can always pick up something there. And any other announcements? No? Okay, well, you all have fun out in the shop. Talk to people, make things. Let's do it. Thank <laughs> you.